verses. Uh, it says this is a psalm when David fled from Absalom, his son. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. There is no help for him in God, Selah. You know, Selah, let's, let's pause and consider this. Let's think about it. Now, this is David. You know David's a type and shadow of Christ, but I, but I, I want you to... I want you to just bring this this right around where, where you are because we experience his life. We experience him. And, I, and, and I'm just going to tell you, I mean, this, this psalm has happened or has happened to us all. If it hadn't happened, just wait. But, that, but, but look what he says. How were they increased that trouble me? I used to, you know, I've said this a thousand times. I used to argue with the Lord and say, Lord, if it was just one or two, but they're increased that trouble me. And here's what they're saying. There's no hope. There's no hope for David's soul in God. It's over for him. It's over. You know, David is the same one that, that wrote, Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell. Suffer his holy one to see corruption. But I can just see them all now looking at David. I mean, I want you to just get this picture in your mind. This is his son that is turned against. His son just denounced himself king. That's the same as saying, My dad David is dead. That's the exact same thing as saying it's dead. Now all we got to do is, is, is uh, act on it. So in other words, as soon as he announced Absalom is king, his cronies were headed up to the castle to kill David and all of those with him. And this wasn't just an enemy. This was his son. This was his son. Now see, I mean, we're going we're gonna to get somewhere here just a little bit because this is exactly what we did down in the garden. When I say we did, we did the same thing down in the garden. When I say we, because we were all in the posterity of Adam, when we decided we would live by our own life, we just announced that God is dead. <coughs> That's what we did. You know, I, I'm thinking of the title of that movie, you know, God is Not Dead. That's what we did, but here's David. There's no, no help. So what, what day? I just want you to get this trek in your mind. He, he goes up by way of the Mount of Olives. He, he goes through the, through the woods that a thousand years later would become the Garden of Gethsemane. See, at this time it wasn't the Garden of Gethsemane. It's just a patch of woods. He goes up through this later to become the Garden of Gethsemane. This is where Jesus sweat become great drops of blood. Goes up on top of the Mount of Olives and it's when he's looking down on Jerusalem and he writes this song. And I want you to, I, I do want you to get this picture because uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes we get in our mindset that these guys that wrote these psalms, you, you ever go back and look at old paintings of Moses or David, they got halos. They got this glow. Well, let me tell you something, David wasn't glowing. His eyes is bloodshot, and I'm sure his crying tears, his sons just turn on him, everybody wants to kill him, and he writes this song, this song. He wasn't glowing. He wasn't glowing. I don't know, you guys ever just open up the psalms and begin to read the psalms? Wow. The people that used to love David are now marching under the banner of Absalom. He, he flees with a few friends. 
Now I want you to just uh, get this picture in your mind because he's lost his family. Sons turned against him, lost his friends, lost his house. He's homeless. He's a refugee. This is the mighty King David that a thousand years later they would say, Jesus, thou son of David, is a refugee. Homeless. Lost it all. Not only that, but the people say there's no help for him in God. Left with the weight of the world on his shoulders. Literally. You know what that word help is right there in verse 2? There's no help. It's the word for salvation. It's the word for deliverance. Salvation, deliverance. The people's opinion is there's no hell. Guys, I'm going to tell you, you know, I just bring this around because, you know, we've, we've, we've you know, started our, uh, our program. I don't know, I hate to call it a program, but, you know, trying to reach out for, for people uh, with addiction. And you know who, who are people with addictions? Everybody and Adam. I'm just telling you the truth. Everybody in Adam is addicted. Addicted to the self. But I know what the world says about people hooked on drugs. There's no help. They can't quit. They can't get off. I mean, have you guys ever heard that? Uh, he's been in rehab 14 times. He's still right there. There's no help for him. I wonder how many times they've said that about you. How many times they said it about me. There's no help for him. He's, he's lost. There is no help for Roger. No help for Clyde. No help for Josh. There's no help. All have turned against him. But I love how David, who goes up through Gethsemane, goes up through those woods on the Mount of Olives, and he's looking down. And he has this thing in his heart, this great contradiction to public opinion, who says there's no hell. David says, but God. But God. But thou, O Lord, a shield for me, my glory, the lifter up of mine head. See, David's attention is on the Lord, not on public opinion. Let me just read. I, I, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I wonder what holy hill that is. You reckon that's Mount Zion? I brought you out to bring you in to what? My holy hill, my holy mountain. You have come to Mount Zion. I laid me down and slept. Now, now guys, you understand the guy's a refugee and he's homeless and all of his friends are turned, his own son is turned against him and yet he lays down and finds rest? For the, uh, I waked for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, and save me. O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth Unto the Lord, thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. I wonder if we ever just stop and think on these things. I 
Here's David. See what what the men say. With men, with men, they say it's impossible. It's no help for Clyde. There's, it's impossible. There's no help for it. What does David say? But with God, all things are possible. I know we say them things sometimes that are just like tongue-in-cheek things. We don't really believe them. We just go around and we quote them. And we just say, with men it's impossible, with God all things are possible. But really we're set down in a place of unbelief and doubt and condemnation and everything else. And we just, we look at the same situation. But David didn't have his eyes on the doubt and the situations and all of those things, Clyde, he had his heart set on the Lord. Why do you think Paul would say, set your affection on things above, not on public opinion? Let me just ask you, uh, you know, I can just throw this out, and I'm going to talk to you just a little, not a whole lot, but, but here's one public opinion that's out there forever. It's in the time. Now, how many years have we been here, and it's the end of time? I just, I just wonder how many I, I'm going to tell you what just about 2,000 years we've been here at this end of time because I, I mean uh, Paul wrote about the end of time Peter wrote about the end of time John wrote about the end I mean it's public opinion but anyway I don't want to go there I just want to talk to you about this, this little word help because here David doesn't give us a, a very much of a definition of this word salvation. So, so I, I want to look. I want to look at this. I want to look at a definition of of salvation. Because uh, you know, I, I do like to uh, talk to people as much as you can. I mean, this is one of, the, one of the big things when you come into church. Have you been saved? I mean, what, are, are you saved? I mean, that's the biggest church question there is, I guess, isn't it? Have you been saved? And then, uh, so, what does that mean, I've been saved? What, I mean, what, do, I mean, if you go ask 99 out of 100 church people, have you been saved? And they say yes. And you say, well, what does that mean? That means I've been saved from hell and I got my ticket and I'm going to go to heaven. When I die. See, there's always that little clause in there, right? When I die, I get to cash in my ticket. But I want to tell you something, guys. I'm going to tell you all right now, as sure as I stand here before you, I got a better salvation than that. I got a lively hope. And when I mean a lively, it's, it's alive and in me, Roger, right this very moment. It's in you. Denise talked a little bit about this covenant, and I'm not going to go, go down that road, but I got, a, I got a salvation that I'm partaking of heaven now. Now that's hard to get a hold of. What do you mean partaking of heaven now? I know where you live. You live up on a hill, a little old double wide house up there. How in the world is that partaking of heaven now? Because I'm partaking of a man who is heaven himself. Who is my shield and my buckler and my reward. My exceeding great reward. I don't care what public opinion says. I don't care how the enemies are gathered around me and say there is no hope. There's no hope for this man and God. I mean, we've been brought into this grace and entrance into unlimited power, into unlimited love. Most people's reference point to salvation has something to do with hell. They, they think salvation is an event that took place on April 10th, 1980 or whatever. I got saved back then. 
Well, I'm going to tell you what, guys, in my life, in my situation, I'm just 50 years old. But from the time I was a little boy, salvation has been at work in my life. I've been in car wrecks. I've been in all kinds of catastrophes. I, I, I'm just, and you guys have too. And salvation has been at work in my life before I even called on his name. Before I even knew who it was that delivered me, he did, Kathy. He did. I mean, he wasn't just sitting there waiting on me to call upon his name. I didn't even know there was a name to call on, yet he was there. I'm going to tell you what, mom's got pictures. I was a little baby boy, 18 months old, in the back of a Volkswagen. And this is why I look so funny. Got run over by another vehicle. My face did. That's why I got this scar right here, right here. The bumper come through the back, the back part of the Volkswagen sitting at an intersection in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Didn't have car seats in the cars back then. Didn't have uh, seat belts. You guys know this. You just laid the baby in the, in the back seat or laid him up in the window. Got broadside in the bumper. 18 months old. Could have took my head off. Salvation. Salvation. Salvation was at work. I didn't even know. It was a little bitty baby. Wasn't something that I had to get activated by saying a sinner's prayer. And I'm going to show you why. This, this has something to do with covenant. Oh, yeah, it has something to do with covenant for sure. But I was 18 months old. I couldn't say a word. That's the reason I want us to look at some of these definitions, some of these things that we've turned because some of them is pitiful. Some of those definitions have nothing to do with what the Bible calls salvation. And yes, I believe in being saved, but it's a lot more than just something that happens to a person when they die. If that's all it is, then it's pretty useless. The word saved in the Hebrew, it's, uh, it means to be open, to be open. Now, I just want you to get this picture because I know this, this may bring a bunch of questions in your mind. It, uh, these things always bring mine, but into my mind, but... To be open, that means not in a closed place. It's, uh, think about, uh, it, it's not a narrow place. I don't know if you've ever been in a narrow place. But, but you, it, it's like, it, it's like walking in a canyon. And it keeps getting narrower and narrower. Until your shoulders are even touching the side where have you ever been in a place where you can't even turn? You you can't even I mean you couldn't turn you couldn't even back out. You're you're you've done walked into a spot, into a bind, into a narrow spot where you can't even move. You know we got we got words for those claustrophobic. And that's that's a word in the Old Testament into a narrow place. It's a word for stress. What do you think stress is? Stress is when the canyons have been pushing on you from all sides and you're, you're blocked in. Where are you going to go? There's no hope for Denise. Look at her. She's hemmed in. There's no way out. There's no hope for God in, in this situation. People get that way. Some people go so far and, and think that death is the only way out of a situation. They do that. We think, 
Oh, we can never, believe you me, you can get in some tough spots. And they think there's no way out. Or they think the only way out of this is a death. And you know what? They're absolutely correct. But they don't realize one's already been provided. One has already... Do you see the goodness and the glory of this thing? The strength that we walked out of in the Garden of Eden, Eden and walked away from and walked into murder and hopelessness and lifelessness and darkness... We walked into all of that and there was no way out except for death. But this covenant God even provided that. When you feel wedged in, now saved means to be brought into an open place, or the, you can read this in the Psalms, brought into a large place. He brought me to a large place. He brought me to a wide open space. I mean, we see this even in, in the definition of, of uh, chains and, and slavery, and there's no way out, but yet... The Lord brings you into a place of freedom, of liberty. He whom the Son makes free is free indeed. He's brought me from the place of stress into a place of freedom. Now, He's brought me to a place where I got room to turn. He's brought me to a place where I got room to pursue him. He, because you, you ever been in a place where you can't even pursue him? He's brought us to a place where there's room to sing, where there's room to dance. Hmm. But here's, here's, here's something that I want to tell you. I don't know if this excites you or not. But when you're in the closed place, when you're in the narrow place and there is no way to turn, you are the perfect candidate for salvation. I don't know, let the, you see to me, I'm, I'm the, you, ever, you ever seen them people that need a new liver, need a new heart, they get on the wait list, and the wait list says, well, I don't know the stages or whatever, but uh, you know, this guy's liver is a little bit bad, but he's this guy's liver right here. He's done turn yalla. He's his liver is done. He don't get one in the next day or two. He's dead. You're in this place. You are a prime candidate for salvation. Huh. This word salvation, it, it, it don't only mean a wide open space, it means safety and security, assurance. Here's a word, unafraid. Unafraid. You don't think people are afraid? People are afraid all the time. We live in fear. And, and, and the stress and the anxiety that comes upon us. I mean, what did Jesus say every time he walked up on them? Fear not. Why would he say that? Because they're living in a state of fear. He knew it. Fear not. It's I. Fear the storm. Oh, the storm. We all recognize the storm. But, you know, we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. What are you going to do when you come up on 5,000 people and you ain't got the money or the means to feed them? Jesus, I don't know if you realize this. We ain't got five loaves and two fishes right here, and there's 5,000 people not counting the women and children. I don't know if you knew this, Jesus, but, you know. Say a lot, Jesus. Think on this. Jesus, I don't know if you realize who's touching you, who's, who has bowed down and washed 
washing your feet. I don't know if you was a prophet you would have known, but now you're going to be unclean. Jesus, I don't know if you realize this, but there was ten lepers that just came up and touched you. We know the Levitical law. I don't know what you're going to do now. You're going to have to walk around and say, I'm unclean too, and leave out of here for seven days. It means being unafraid, free from being trapped. No longer in a state of poverty in spirit. No longer a state of poverty in mind and emotions. Listen to this. It means you have been avenged. Meaning someone has come to save you. Hmm. It means somebody has... When you've been surrounded by your enemies, and guys, just don't think of this as people. Our enemies are stress and situations and uh, just normal, everyday things that, that come with us. But what this means is somebody has came in to where you were and got you plumb out of the situation and brought you into a large place. I hope when you go back and read the Psalms and you begin to see, he's brought me into a large place. Brought me into his holy hill. You have been delivered. And I'll tell you, even in the, in the New Testament, the word saved even means to make a person whole. Healed. And I, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm just telling you the way it is. There was a man come up here, didn't even have an arm, grew an arm back, grew, grew his hand back. It was withered away. I'm just crazy enough to believe the very things happened. I believe there was a, there was a woman that had, that had been bent over, daughter of Abraham. At least she stood up straight. I believe there's a crippled man laying there at the pool of Bethesda. Hadn't walked in 38 years. I believe he got right up. I believe there was a man that stood there at the gate, beautiful, begging alms. I believe Peter said, silver and gold have I none, such as I have, I give up. I believe he, that man got up. I believe there was a man that was born blind. Mom and daddy and everybody in the temple knew this man was born blind. All, all he knew was I was blind and now I see. Don't even know the man's name that did it. Don't even know who. All I know is I was blind. Now I see. Salvation. Bringing you into a place where you can breathe. You know that's praying without ceasing is the same thing as saying breathing without ceasing. You guys ever seen anybody have anxiety attacks? They can't breathe. You guys ever, ever suffered with stress? What's the first thing that happens? You start, you can't breathe. God, I'm telling you that I'm telling you the truth of these things. I know I've experienced them. You get a lot of stress on you, you can't breathe. Pressure. What do, you, what do you think happened when, when here is, here's Israel, been enslaved for 400 years, just got out, midnight, came out in the darkness, didn't they? Came out in the midst of the thick darkness, came out in the midst of, of all the crying, of all the death that had just took place. Not a dog is moving, it's lips against the, the children of Israel. They come out they begin to walk into the wilderness, going to a place they have no idea. They don't know where this place is. 
God so far removed from them, they don't, they don't know anything about them. They just cried and following Moses says, come on, and, and they gather up and they come out and, he, and, they, and they're, they're, they're following this cloud and this fiery pillar and this thing leads them straight to a giant red sea that you can't even see across. Right behind them, they hear the, the clangling of the chariots coming up right behind them. What do you think they're going to say? It was better to just stay in bondage. At least I knew where I was. At least I had my own life. Yeah, I was making bricks, but look. Giant sea before me. All these enemies that have pinned us in. What did God tell them? Stand still. Now we quote them scriptures, but can you imagine those people sitting there saying, what do you mean stand still? Well, you know what? They didn't have a choice. Where were they going to go? I only knew of two people that ever walked on the water, Jesus and Peter, as long as he looked at them, and they couldn't even fathom the idea of walking across the sea. They, wasn't, they knew Delta Airlines wasn't going to swoop in, come down and pick them up, or, and, 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 and 14 military helicopters going to fly in and hold the enemy back while C-130s got everybody to the other side. Stand still and see what? The salvation of the Lord. They were a prime candidate for the salvation of the Lord. Why? They're hemmed in. They're in a tough spot. They're in a pickle. And think about this. They had no imagination how God was going to do it. None. I, I just throw this right on left. If they didn't know who he was, they wouldn't have killed him. They had no idea how God was going to deliver them through that well, uh, I'm going to tell you what, uh, Clyde, Moses, uh, God's going to drive the sea and you're going to go through on dry ground. I can just see them laughing. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. I mean, of all the ways to do it, I mean, he did, he, I mean, there was times when they was out there and he says, Moses, hold up your hands. Send out the warriors, Joshua, and long as Moses held up his hands, they would win the battle. They didn't even have an ark to set out before them, did they? Beforehand, bring out the ark, and they would set the ark out before them. And they, they, as they marched in battle with that ark, and all the enemies just fell by their side, and they could march around. But not this time. Not this time. They're, they're in a bad spot. The guys they just robbed... What do you mean, Rob? They come out of there with all the gold in Egypt because these people are saying, here, take my diamonds, take my jewelry, take my gold, just get out of here. They come out with all the loot. Not only that, all the firstborn flies and all the firstborn ducks and all the firstborn cows and goats and people are dead in Pharaoh's own son. So these guys, a little ticked off, stand still and see the help, the deliverance, how I'm going to bring you into this large place. See, this is what salvation does, guys. Can you imagine when Moses held his hands out and the east wind blew all night long? I can just see them in the darkness say, saying, that Moses guy has lost it. Standing over the sea with a rod in his hand, his hands over the wind blowing. Moses, see you in the morning if there is a morning. We're going to bed. And they get up in the morning. And the sea is standing up in a heap. And the ground ain't even muddy. And they go through on dry ground. See, this is what salvation will do. It will leave you speechless. Salvation will go beyond your vocabulary in a heartbeat. See, I, I, see, this is the salvation, Roger. I'm telling you about it. It's a whole lot better than a ticket. Because this salvation, I just look and I say, wonderful and marvelous is this salvation that I'm partaking of now. Let me, let, me just, let me just go on.
This, this word salvation, see, it's a word of action. It's an action word. You know, we got action figures. Salvation is an action word. It's a moving word. It's, it's, it's a word where God is actually coming and delivering you from the situation. It's, it's Him actually coming in and pushing back the walls that have closed you in. Taking off the chains and delivering you. Holding the enemies back while He delivers you. It's a mighty work. Bringing you into a large place. See, God only is the Savior. I know what you're just thinking. I, I could go through all the scriptures and show you God our Savior. That's, that's right there. And see, this thing is always thrown in the face. Now listen to what I'm going to tell you. This thing is always thrown in the face of pagan gods. Because here's the question, will your God save you now? Because I want to tell you what, if you won't, then he's not worth being called a God and he's sure not worth being worshipped. Now think about what I'm telling you. Because this is what's thrown up into, this is what Paul would throw up into the Greek space. On Mars Hill. You don't know this God. This God here is actually worthy. Worthy of worship. This God here will actually save you and he has. What do your gods do? See, he loves us. This is one of the points that sometimes I think I, I missed. How we love this. Oh, we quote Galatians 2.20 all the time. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. Who loved you. Who loved me. Gave himself for me. See, here's the situation. Death. See, that's why death is thrown up in everybody's face. That's why even as, as young kids, they see it. I can remember kids looking, maybe a, a groundhog on the side of the road, it's dead. Why ain't it moving? It's dead. It's no hope. It's out of here. Go to funerals. What's the matter with Grandma? Why ain't she getting up? She's dead. Look at the hopeless situation. This is this was our situation. This was the situation of mankind. Impossible. This was the situation that in Psalms 3 they said about David. It's impossible. I mean, if this would have been a Philistine enemy, oh yeah, David's a mighty warrior. This is his own son. It's impossible. David's out of here. It's over. And even worse than death, what could be worse than death? Here we are in the darkness of the light, so we don't even know the extent of the situation. We don't. Kind of like the Pharisees. Well, thank God I'm not like old Johnny over there. You know, I'm not as bad as he is. <laughs> he's, he's real bad, you know. I, yeah, I know, I do some bad things. Yeah, I've had, you know, but boy, old Johnny over there. And here's, here's, uh, here's something even worse. We're so used to the situation. We don't even know it's not normal. I mean, if all you know is darkness, you think darkness is normal. 
That's what we do, Clyde. That's what we do. We think we don't even know our need. So far removed from God, walked away so far away, living in the darkness of the situation, we don't even know the situation. 430 years, all them guys, they didn't, they didn't grow up dreaming. You know, I think when I grow up, I'm going to be an architect. I think I'm going to be a doctor. Hey, I think I'm going to play football. No, they just made bricks. But see, we think, hey, we live in a free country. Yeah, right. I'm thankful. Listen, I served this country, United States Marine Corps. Tim served in the Air Force. I know there's some other veterans probably around. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that, I, that we can come up here and play whatever music we want to play. I'm thankful we can choose to come to this building. And, I, and I'm thankful I can choose where to go to work. I'm thankful, but that's not freedom. You don't want anything. You know that. Well, I got the deed to my house. Well, don't pay your taxes next two years. See how long you got the deed to it. It's called public auction. Well, I own my car. I got the title. Yeah, try that too. Try not to pay your taxes on that for a couple of years. See how long you got the title to it. Sometimes I, I look around, you know, and I, and, I, and I see this thing because, we, you know, when we went into core, they would say God, country, core. God, country, core. And they talk about the freedom that we tried to preserve. And I look around and I say, where is the freedom? They say that the life expectancy is going up. That has took a sharp turn now, guys. It's not going up. It's going down. People are dying of drug addiction and suicide and stress-related illnesses everywhere. Right here in this country, right here in this county, right here in this town that's happening. The funeral home director tells me he buries more people in the 40s than he does in the 80s. Why is that? Freedom? Turn on the TV. This is one thing that I hate the most is commercials because they're always telling you what you lack. That's all they do. Telling you you're in this state. If you'll buy this Angus burger from Hardee's, you'll go from a state of stress and anxiety to a state of joy and the perfect marriage because you bought a hamburger. People believe it. Of course, we're counting on Tim to put us in a state of joy here in about two weeks <laughs> when he cooks in burgers. But you see, you see what I'm talking about. And I mean, I'm just throwing this out there at you guys. You know the situation. People come to church with their painted face on that it's all right. And you, and you leave out of here dreading to go back into the hell you call life. Stress and anxiety. And listen, I've not been untouched by it myself. They got a pill for it. They got a pill for everything. But I'm telling you what, we got something that's much greater. We got a man who's got a name. His name is Jesus. Let me just, let me just keep on going. God is our salvation. It's who He is. See, we say God is love. That doesn't mean God has some emotion about you. It's who God is. The same yesterday, today, and forever. It's who He is. It's who He always is. It's who He was and who He always will be. God is love. God is salvation. It's who He is. See, now listen. Salvation is not subjective. What do I mean? I mean it doesn't depend on how I feel today whether salvation is valid or not. It doesn't depend on a report that my senses bring me because my senses will bring me a report and say, this situation is not good. 
Then my spider alert goes off. My spider sense goes off and says, stress, stress, danger, Will Robinson, danger, danger. Salvation is objective. It's an objective reality. God is Savior. God has saved us already, whether we feel it or not. Now here's a little, here's a little tidbit on covenant. To that, to that salvation, God has promised with covenant blood and with an oath that He is our Savior. In every situation. He promised with an oath and with blood. He promised in covenant. I'm your savior. That's who I am. In every situation. We forget those things. We feel all up. In every situation. Hmm. How, how did he do that? Salvation became flesh. What? Salvation became flesh and entered into the human situation. Listen to what I'm Salvation became a man and entered into the human situation of the lie, of darkness, and of death. He entered into it. It became personal when salvation became a person. See, salvation, it's not an abstract word uh, to describe something God does. Salvation became a man. Now, now, let me show you something. Salvation became a man. Now, Jesus was born a Hebrew. Do you know what the Hebrew word for salvation is? Yeshua. Joshua. Do you know what Jesus' Hebrew name was? Yeshua. Joshua. Jesus' salvation became. God is my Savior. God became a man. Entered into our human situation. Let me, let, me, let me show you something here. Go with me to Psalm 98. I'm going to give you just a little bit of definition of salvation. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. The Lord hath made known his salvation, his righteousness, hath he openly shown in the sight of the heaven. Mm, 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 mm. He made known his Yeshua. That's the word right there. He made known his Joshua. He made known his salvation. I mean, you can go look this up and it's Yeshua. He made known his Joshua. See, it's a little, but I, I just want to capitalize it in my Bible now. He made known his salvation. You know that word back over in Psalm when they mocked David and said there's no help for him? Guess what word the word help is? Yahshua. They said there's no Jesus for David. There's no Jesus for Denise. She's out of here. She's in a mess. David said, but... But thou, O oh Lord, but thou, O oh Lord, of my Yeshua. Let me, let me show you something here. Let me, show you, let me show you something. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yeshua. Why? Because he's going to save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold a virgin 
shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us the name of God with us is what? Yeshua my salvation Yeshua let, let me show you another one here uh, you know uh, here, here is uh Here's Simeon, the old priest that would circumcise the children that was eight years old. What does he say? Mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Who's he holding in his hand? Yeshua. See, they didn't name the baby till after they circumcised him. So the baby couldn't be called Jesus until Simeon circumcises the baby. And then he's, na he na he's naming the baby right there. Because as soon as they circumcised the baby, it's when they gave it the name. What's this baby's name? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. I don't know if this gets older. It just, just excites me. Lord, it excites me. Salvation. It's the real thing, the real thing, the real person, the real man, and you're in covenant with him because it's who he is. Now, don't forget this. Listen. See, salvation comes to its finality in, in, in the cross in the shedding of the blood and in his resurrection. What, what do I mean by that? Because we, we died with him, but we didn't just stay died. We rose with him to do what? Walk in largeness, walk in newness of life. Brought us out of the kingdom of darkness. Translated us into largeness. Brought us into his holy hill, into the kingdom of his dear son. See, I told you it's not subjective, meaning it doesn't depend on whether you feel it or not. But this is where you are. You're in the kingdom of his dear son now. What do I feel all the stress around me? But God, what do we need to do? We need to set our affection on him who is our savior. But God, I don't care what public opinion says, but God... It's my shield. God, and what do you mean he's my shield? He has surrounded me. Stay with me. Stay with me. I'm almost done. I'll be done here in 10 minutes. We're participators of his life. I mean, how could we sum up Jesus' ministry? If we had to just give it one sentence ministry, he come to do what? Seek and save that which was what? Lost. See, most people don't even know their, their, their condition where they was. He didn't, he didn't come to call the, the righteous to repentance. He come to call the sinners. Those that knew they had need. So we can rejoice in the fact, knowing that we have need. See, we don't like that. We don't, we, don't, we don't like that, do we? Now look, let me go back here to verse 1. Sing unto the Lord a new song. So we associate salvation with what? A brand new song. A song that's never been heard before. A song, there's never been a melody like this to this song before. A brand new song. It's fresh. It's a new song because it's a new application of salvation. See, they just thought April 10th, 1979, I got saved. Where's a new song with that? That's an old song, ain't it? This is a new song. Singing to the Lord a new song. See, we walk in a world, guys, you know this, of sin and death and darkness and the lie all around us. But yet it's as if we have an umbrella, a covering 
which cannot be pierced. The man himself. I mean, really, guys, we God know this for a fact. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Why? Because I'm tough and I'm strong? Because I'm a mighty warrior? Because death can't... Because thou art with me. And he said, I will never leave you, Beverly, or forsake you. Why? Because it's who he is. God is salvation. God is love. It's who he is. Yeah, I know. Well, uh, Psalm 23, that's a psalm about Jesus. But Jesus became a man. And he entered into the situation. And if I'm in covenant with that man, which we are, he ain't leaving me either. Why? Because that's who he is. And I could go on farther. We're going to cover this one of these days on down the road. But... How could he be a God if he didn't have any people? Because he said, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. So you are important. You are important. If he's going to be your God and you're going to be his people, this God has to have some people so that he can demonstrate his, because it's who he is. He created us to love. That's why he made you, each and every one of you. He made you so that he could fill you with his love, so that he could fill you with himself. Because that's what love does. Love gives, love shares. That's who he is. A new soul. A new soul. We've been brought into enlargement, to wholeness. What did, uh, what did he say, Jeremiah, say? Thy loving kindness is new every morning. It's new every morning. It's new every moment, Roger. This ain't a salvation I can walk around and say that I walked in in 1979 and I got baptized and I got saved. I'm telling you what, I've experienced salvation this very day. This very moment. If you are, my friends, it's available to you. The table is set. Come and dine. Whosoever will, come and drink. Who that's thirsty, let them come and drink. It's who he is. My God, I mean, this is, I'm throwing this right up in the, in the face of the pagan gods who, who want to deny salvation and say, well, he lost his salvation. How can you lose Jesus? Let me tell you something. I didn't lose him. I was the one that lost. He came and got me, Roger. Came and got me. Hmm. It's time for a new song. Same subject. Same subject, but a brand new song, ain't it? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Now look. For he hath done marvelous things. Marvelous. That, that's a word. It, it, it means wonderful. It means uh, fresh. It means unexpected. It also has this, this word in with it. It, me, it means it was impossible for a human to accomplish this. How then can a man be saved? How then can a man be saved? But except God become a man... It's impossible with men, but with God, all things are possible. It's impossible then. I mean, Jesus, you're telling me stuff. You're telling me all this stuff. Well, then how then can a man be saved? Marvelous. Wonderful. Hmm. Here's, here's, the, here's the same, same word that's used over in, in Genesis. You remember, you remember Sarah and Abraham? They couldn't have a child. But then the angel comes down and tells them we're going to have a child. And Sarah begins to laugh. What does Abraham say? Is anything too hard? That's the word hard. Is anything too hard for God? Is, is this thing impossible for God? I mean, is this not Paul before King Agrippa? Why do you think it a thing incredible that God should raise the dead? 
<laughs> My God, this very hope that I'm being stoned and put in prison for is the very hope I'm declaring to you this day that you, even King Agrippa, can partake of him. Even you, Caiaphas, who nailed your Savior to the cross. Even you, Caiaphas. Hmm. He's the God of marvels. He delights in doing the impossible. You hear what I'm telling you? It's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He delights in doing the possible. Let, let, let me show you what Paul says here. I mean, see, I, 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 didn't, I didn't, didn't get this, but, but look at this. Here's Paul praying that you may be able to comprehend. You might be able to get our little pea brains around this marvelous works that he has done. What's the breadth, the length, the depth, the height? See, I'm talking a place of what? Largeness. That you might be able to understand the freedom, the room here to move in. Before, oh gosh, it was a closed place. Go look, go look at the size of that natural temple. It wasn't very big, Clyde. It was big enough for one man to go into the most holy place. That's all it was room for. But now in Solomon's temple, it got bigger. But I'm going to tell you what now. Jabez has enlarged his tents. <laughs> Jabez's tents has gotten way bigger right there, Roger. Yeah, there's room. In my father's house, there's plenty of room. You, you're with me, ain't you? And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Yes, you are. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. How in the world are we going to get out of this mess of Red Sea? Enemies all around. I mean, even fathom the fact the sea's going to dry up and we're going to go through. How in the world could stripping a man naked, beating him to a pulp, putting a crown of thorns on his head, deliver me from this mess that I am? But, oh, with men, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That's why Paul rejoiced in the fact of saying, I'm crucified. I was Saul of Tarsus. I was a murderer, chief of sinners. God done a mighty work in me. Marvelous work. Began to sing a new song. Oh, yeah. I'm hurrying. So if it's possible for you to get out of the situation, it's not marvelous. And isn't that what we do? Don't we try everything with the human mind to get out of every situation we're in? And when you do, you think, oh, thank you. No, he didn't deliver you. You did by your cunning and your wit. He'll bring you into a place where only he can deliver you. So if you got out, it's not marvelous. That word's reserved for him. And when, and when he does it, we sing a new song. Now look what he says. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. Oh, wait a minute. Got him the victory? And see that word victory, right? Got him the victory. That's the same word too. Yeshua. Got him the Why did he need the victory? I want you to think about this. I thought salvation was for me. Right? But this says that God him the victory. Let me just read. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. See, we thought it was all about us. Yeah, he saves in all situations, but for himself. See, now, now I'm beginning to think, is he arrogant? I mean, what is going on now? He's saying he got the victory for himself. Let me, let me tell you something. God is creator, right? Everybody knows that. God created. First verse. In the beginning, God created. But what's that mean? That means God took the initiative. He took the initiative. We're here out of his goodness. 
We're here out of his kindness, out of his mercy. We're here because he chose that we would be here. There were no accidents with God. There still ain't any accidents with God. These little babies born out of what people call wedlock. Do you think they're accidents? They ain't no way, can they? Everybody's here because God chose it to be so. And if he chose it to be so, then he takes the responsibility to remove the evil and to reveal who he really is over against the lie and to bring about his purpose in creation. That's why he could say in John 12, Father, glorify your name. What do you mean glorify your name? You're going to the cross. He's fixing to go up to the cross and he says, in this the Father's name will be glorified. See, that just sounds all contradictory, don't it? Because we don't think you could glorify a man's name in the shedding of blood and being crucified. They mocked him. Now listen. In that cross he was honored. Why? See, he loves us, but his love for us is not some fickle emotion that's Good one day and bad the next. That's our whole religious upbringing. We thought we could lose salvation if we ticked God off, didn't we? We thought we got salvation because we're doing good, but then I messed up and now salvation. Oh, God don't love me anymore. Or, you know, he loves you, but God loves the person, but he hates the sin. You know, we hear all these crazy things that, that go on out there. His love for us is bound up with who he is. Bound up in his honor. His honor. He delights over us. His love is a love of strong choice. A choice that will go to death. That went to death for us. And raise again. See, he does things for his name's sake. Not our name say. See, you use the word Jim. People that know me, my name's bound up with history, right? It's got all my achievements. It's got all my mess ups. It's got everything that's bound up with, with that in my name. So often we come to God in our own name. What do you mean come in our own name? We think, okay, I'm going to go to God on my achievements, my religious pride. God, you know, and I've did this before, guys. God, you know I drove from Charlotte, North Carolina to Circleville, Ohio to preach in a church that had three people in it. Thou therefore, thus thou, almighty God, should therefore thus bless me. Now, I didn't say it in those religious terms, but I went expecting Nothing happened, and I began to argue with God. I said, God, do you realize how far I drove? <laughs> you realize how much gas it cost me to get all the way up here? And then, then, or we come to God in our own name by saying, Oh, Lord God, you know I'm not worthy. I'm not worth a, a plug nickel. I, whose name are we coming in? We're still coming in ours. He does this for his name's sake. There's another name given. A name that is above every name. A name that swallows up all the other names. The name of Yeshua. We come in his name. Clothed, just like the priest did when he brought us in there. Covered in his name. We can come in there because it's who he is. Yeah. I know I'm hurrying. God's action in your life has nothing to do with your name. It's never about who you are. It's who He is. It's about His name. God is Savior. God is salvation. God is life. It's about His name. That's why before, that's why none can come to Him except He draws. And let me tell you, He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw them all unto me. The action is done started. The snowball is already rolling.
God loves you and saves you because it's who he is. Has nothing to do with getting yourself right and being ready. It's what he's done in Christ and what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. He won salvation for himself. When he won salvation, you know what you are then? You're the trophy. You're the trophy that he won for himself. You are. Your soul is the very trophy that he was after. Everybody runs a race. To win a prize. But let me tell you what. He, he ran the race. He won the race. And you're the prize. <laughs> you're the trophy that he brought back. He said why? He come to the Father with what? Many sons unto glory. God just excites me. I don't know if it does you or not. But it excites me. He ran the race. And he won the race. Mm. we rest in who he is God who started this work in you he's able to perform it under the day of Jesus Christ begun this good work in you this good work of what? salvation see people go to church every Sunday they go to church and they get talked out of their salvation and say you need to repent you need to come up here and try to find your salvation again Got to do this to keep it. No, this ain't an insurance policy that you go home and put in the top drawer and hope you don't lose it when your house burns down. I always wanted that. I got all my stuff in there in a drawer. My house burns down. I lose it all. This ain't that. Salvation ain't an insurance policy. I used to hear them say, God dangling you over hell with gasoline underwear. This ain't it. Salvation is Jesus. He comes to you. It's his arm. It's his power. It's his honor. It's his glory. You remember, you remember the, the shepherd? You, you know, in Luke 15, we got a lost sheep. We got a lost coin. We got a, we got a lost son. And we always preach the things that was lost. But it's, but it's not about the sheep that was lost. It's about the shepherd. Why did he go after the sheep? Because it's who the shepherd is. It's to the honor of the shepherd. Not to lose any sheep. Right? Father, thou that they've given me, I've lost. None. I've lost none. It's his honor. Listen to what I'm telling you, Kathy. It's God's honor to go get you where you are. My Lord, do you see what I'm talking about? Sometimes I just want to grab people up and just call people out, and I, I, I just want to say, Rhonda, do you understand? It's to His honor to come and get you right where you are. You go tell her this God's in hot pursuit. God's in hot pursuit. But why? Because something you did, something you deserve? Absolutely not. It's because it's who he is. He does it for his name, his honor, his glory. That's why he went to the cross, because that's who he is. I will love you even if it costs me my life, and it did. I will go in and get you in the midst of death. I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, with, with me and it's impossible. But with me, all things are possible. I'm going to become a man and go right into the place where they are and deliver them and bring them out of that place and cover them and be their shield and their exceeding great reward. Bring them into my inheritance so I can fill them with my life and my love so that I can love them. Because that's who I am. That's a new song to me. That's a new song. I, I got a little bit right on here in the back. 
Salvation is not subjective, but objective. You were included in Christ's death, raised up to walk in a new song. And faith says amen to that. Now listen to this. The Lord, verse 2, the Lord hath made known his Yahshua. He made known as Yahshua. You know what known means? Known means to be brought in intimate union. People say, people say, what do they say about eternal life? What do these days going to have eternal life? He said, this is eternal life that you might know Yahshua. This is eternal life, Father, that you might know. And it, now he's made known as Yahshua. He's made known as salvation. He's brought you into union with his salvation. This is not a far off, something I'm waiting for at death sometime to go get. My God, he's brought you into union with it. He's brought you unto himself for his honor, because it's who he is. For his glory, because it's who he is. Because he's the Father. Psalm 3, what did they say? There's no Yahshua for David. There's no Yahshua for you. But thou, O oh Lord. See, what they didn't realize is they were describing salvation in Psalms 3 when they said there's no Yahshua for David. There's not even a word yet. Because the word I'm about to use ain't even in your vocabulary. See, they're describing a situation that's impossible. And God says, finally, I got you in a situation that's impossible. Now I can begin to show who I really am. You remember the last time we was here, what them sons of the prophets said, Candy? They said, this place is too straight for us. It's too narrow. Let us go and build a place so that we can have room to grow, room to expand. You know the story. I mean, we talked about the story. It goes down to top wood, the accent falls off. But then the axe head got up. They didn't know the axe head flood was going to be their way out of the narrow place into a large place, into his holy hill. Salvation is not an event to Disneyland in the sky. It's being unfolded in our daily lives. We step into him whose name is marvelous, whose name is wonderful, whose name is counselor, whose name is mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. The increase of his government, there shall be no end. And I love this last part. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform it. Not you. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform it. And he did it. And he said it's finished. Now here's what Paul says. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Not might. Not maybe. Shall be saved. Amen. Amen.